Hey, hello everyone. Uh, I can see still a few people there trying to find their places. I hope you all had a great time yesterday at the party and that you are ready to receive new knowledge today too. Uh, my name is Svetlina and today I'm going to tell you a bit more about why design and seamless communication should go hand in hand. Probably most of what you're here today would sound a lot like common sense. And this is the question that I've been constantly asking myself. Is this common knowledge? Is this something that people tend to know but ignore? And in the beginning of my career, I found out that people rarely see the importance of something that it's not in their job descriptions. Um, but before I continue, and before I tell you why I'm saying everything that I will be saying today, I first need to introduce myself so you know who is speaking to you. My, um, I'm currently head of design at Lime Chain, which is an innovative blockchain company. We build customer-oriented solutions, and they're all based on the blockchain technology, obviously. I have wide experience in the IT industry, mainly because I started as a front-end developer, then I tried to transition into back-end, and it was a huge struggle, obviously, at least for, from a designer point of view. And I have experience even on project ma management, and I was even a game designer for a bit. But I'm currently and entirely focused on trying to solve the UX problems in the blockchain world, which, believe me, there's a lot of them. But I'm not saying all of this just to introduce myself. Uh, nowadays, technological demands have tried and have forced designers to s develop skills outside of their comfort area. So it's no longer acceptable to be skilled in design aesthetics alone. You should probably have a, at least common knowledge on what front-end developer framework is, and besides having, of course, excellent UI skills. Something else, uh, can you show me how many of you have heard about the term design unicorn? Yeah. Well, it's exactly this, the designer who knows how to code and is even a designer. But we miss the fact, usually, that it's, it's more, more than that. It's more than just UI skills. It's more than just front-end development. The industry is so demanding that nowadays designers should know how to code, how to be great at UI, you sh they should probably know every UX theory there is, and of course all of this while condu conducting usability testings and trying to get the results out of it. Of course, everywhere, uh, this comes down to the fact that they're using all of the design tools that are on the market today while conducting interviews and so on and so forth. So it's very complex and demanding field and for a designer to do that, well, it sounds almost humanly impossible for a person to be skilled in everything, isn't it? Well, today I'll be giving you the secret of how to achieve or at least fake to some extent how to be good in a bunch of those skills. It's simple and uh, it's complex at the same time. It's collaboration, but it needs to be thorough. I'll try to elaborate a bit more about, you're probably, you're, you're probably thinking, why is this random girl trying to convince me that communication is hard and no one, everyone can't do it? So, well, I'll start to chop it up bit by bit and I'll begin with, what's a UX UI designer? What are we usually doing? Well, the definition is clear. We usually design stuff, but in the process of doing that, we're pretty annoying because we question everything and we ask questions all the time, uh, all in this in order to just draw our rectangles. What we are missing, though, is that in the process of asking our questions, we communicate with a bunch of people all on the line trying to give us information and we try to give it to them so that we can build our product successfully. It's easy to just build a product, but it's hard to be, build it in a way that it's going to be self, sold on the market. 
design is basically communication anyway. So in order for us to be good designers, we need to know how to be good communicators first. And now I'll start with a bad example of communication that I might have or might have not been part of. This is a snippet of an email that a long time ago someone on the line wrote. Uh, it says, I'll be going through the feedback received two weeks before our deadline to make a revision of the requested changes in order to check if there is something missing along the line in the design screen, which was then implemented from a development point of view without having the possibility to sync internally, which affected our relationship with the client. How many of you lost everything in mid-sentence? Yeah, right. Well, it took me like a minute just to read it. If I want to understand what it says here, I will have to reread it at least two times and then think about it a bit too much. When in reality, the meaning is very, very simple. I'll just review previous screens and I'll see the fe feedback and I'll let you know what happened. So there is a rule to communication. The simpler, the better. It may sound like common knowledge, but believe me, unfortunately, it's not. Uh, right now, the next step on my agenda is to list the six things that I'm trying to do in the beginning of every project that I start on, because they usually clear out most of my mistakes along the line, and they prevent me from doing more. First one on the list is to over communicate. You should inform in advance and then inform again. It might sound too much, but it's something that's necessary. We should try to communicate our plans and our ideas as much as possible. And unfortunately, it's not common knowledge to everyone. Uh, that's just responsible behavior to just communicate your plans and say, okay, I'm going to do that today. I plan on doing it the way that I'm doing it. Get, familiar, get people on your team familiar with your process. I have this great example. I was on a project with a fellow colleague of mine. She was also a designer. What she loved to do was to work after hours on a project that we collaborated together. Right now, when I think about it, it's fun when I look back in time and see how it all worked out, but she loved to make changes when I was out of the office, and on the next day when I came to the office, I see a bunch of changes done in my file. I have no idea if that's communicated with the development team or if that's approved by client or whatever it is. It was messy, but we cleared it out. And I realized that not everyone would express their ideas the way that I would. So instead of accepting it as common sense, let's accept the fact that all of our teammates have great ideas. The key to that is to just consult with them on time, and they usually give you the necessary feedback that you need to build your product if you collaborate on a project together. My most favorite thing to this day is to be part of my team because we have this thing where whenever some, someone from our team has a struggle with some design decision that they need to make, uh, we're consulting. We're literally gathering in a circle and we're trying to find the best solution possible. Not only this builds great relationships, but it also gives the person, it gives the designer one or two more options to build their products and explore other versions of it. Other thing on the list is to share your work early and ask for feedback often. This is really, really valued in uh, startup environments, but in every environment nonetheless. Uh, just call it work in progress. Uh, ask for advice and call it a day. It's very simple. But don't forget to say, whenever you need to say, I don't know the answer, but I'm going to find out. A designer is not paid to have all the answers at all times. It's paid to find the answers to those problems. But do not discount the value of getting things done. 
because we tend to try and strive for seamless communication and everyone on the team being happy and so on and so forth, that we forget that there are things called deadlines that we need to be aware of, that they're coming soon and we need to hand off our product. Um, I also have example for this. Um, I have wide range of experience on working on different products and not just cool products that are very commonly used. I once had a client who um, demanded a specific software for his medical pump. Um, to this day, this is the most complex project that I've worked on. And just because, it, just because of its complexity, the team that I was working on, we entirely focused on understanding what's this product about. So what we did, because it was a medical pump and we had not, no knowledge or whatsoever on the subject and our client wasn't very helpful either, we just watched YouTube videos every day for months and months until we finally figured it out, which was great. And to this day, I still count myself a medical expert on pumps and infusions, but at the end we were waving at the deadline goodbye because we just couldn't deliver. And the moral to this story is no matter deadlines, no matter team effort or whatever, no help should go unnoticed. It's very important to reach out to your teammates and let them know that you're, uh, you can help them in whatever, they, whatever way they need help but you should always give them credit and appreciate what they're doing for you. Um, there are three types of companies usually, budget-oriented ones, client-oriented ones, and employee-oriented ones. Two of them have the common problem of not putting the employee first, and they tend to ignore that clients do not come first, employees come first. And if you don't take care of your employees on time, they won't take care of your clients. So better change that, better make fe people feel appreciated. Otherwise, nothing will be successful at the end of the situation. You're most probably wondering though, uh, why, why am I hearing all of this? Uh, especially in corporations and big companies in general, it's very easy to not try to communicate this much and just go with the flow because uh, there are processes that are established and even if you make a mistake, it's not, it's not a big deal. Well, you just don't need to go with the flow if you want to be aligned with your team. You always, as a designer, we always should make our understanding of the project clear and convincing for a designer to explain everything. He should be familiar with everything that's on the line. Something else, in the beginning of the projects, probably in the finishing phases or so on, we, that's when we understand why are we building this product? We, who is our target audience? What are we doing? Why are we doing it? It gives us alignment. We know what end goal we're striving for and we're going towards it. The second point to that is to be transparent you should always make sure your process is communicated. For a designer to communicate their process is seemingly important, not only because it's common sense and so on, but let's assume that you're in a situation where you start your design process and you're saying that to your development team, I am about to start my design process. In their heads, what usually happens is that they are expecting some screens, some design screens soon from you. But when by I'm starting my design process, you either mean I'm starting to build my wireframes or I'm trying to get all of my testings and conduct my usability testings, get my reports and so on and so forth. There is a gap of the process and if it's communicated. And if we clear that from the start, we have proper work estimation, which really speeds up our process, let me tell you. 
because to this point, I've been trying to say to you what a designer does, but in a more hidden way. But to this point, we've covered that designers usually gather requirements. They also map out functionalities and flow, and of course, user roles and permissions. We tend to take into account business logic, but also UX logic and restrictions, and we shouldn't forget to apply best practices. But probably somewhere along the line, we are starting our design process with wireframes, and then we need to consult with BAs and project managers regarding user stories, and of course, to communicate our design decisions with the development team to get familiar if there are restrictions or we should change something. And of course, manage clients' feedback, manage users' feedback, decision validation. We need to implement visual design, send screens to Zeppelin and Vision or whatever tool you're using for development, conduct usability testing somewhere along the line. You probably tested something in some way, and you probably need to finish your usability report. Uh, but also to check implementation progress, create and scale design system. That's very, very common and trendy right now. Everyone should have a design system about everything. And we need to make sure our client is happy and everyone is happy and the goal is met and the team is met. And there are no features that are built out of scope. And then we have handoff. Simple, right? That's just in one day eventually especially if you're working in a fast-paced environment, that's almost impossible to do without losing something along the line. Well, what should we do in cases like this? It might sound like I'm repeating myself, but just be the active site. Be active with your manager, be proactive with your client, be proactive with your team, especially be proactive with your development. And do not forget that each role is key to building a product successfully. I'll try to crumble it down a bit. Starting with the clients, how should we collaborate better with them? Well, first, we need to understand their needs. Probably they want to be aware and make sure that we understand what their product is about. And we need to consider our audience. Whenever a project starts, we tend to ignore the fact that there is usually one point of contact and one product manager. And whenever there are five people from the client side, not all of them have the same approval ratings. So we should be sure who is giving, who is approving what and how. But don't forget to forget the designer language. We are so blinded by the knowledge that we have that we assume that whenever we say, oh, I'm just going to do those wireframes, everyone knows a wireframe, what a wireframe is, right? Well, it turns out it's not like this. So switch to a normal English language and just explain what you're about to do and how are you about to do it. And if you can't, visual aids always help and remember to repeat yourself often and again until the client feels safe, like his product is in the right hands and we have the knowledge that we need and we understood his idea and so on and so forth. It sounds easy, right? But we tend to ignore it, most of it, or depending of course on clients and projects, but having those five, six points on our checklist helps a lot. Let's crumble it down and address the elephant in the room, which is usually our development team. I have this horrible example of a colleague of mine. Uh, it's about the same medical project that I told you earlier. She was, uh, let's start from the beginning. We already had returned the product because it was so different from the original design that we just needed to ask our developers to spend a bit more time on it. And on the third time, my colleague um, didn't have the patience to think about it too much. And she just straight ahead said, did you guys forget to look at the design screens or you just decided to implement it however it would fit your personal preference? Well, she was 
obviously very harsh in her expression, but I can't stand behind the development side either. But how are we about to change that? Usually, this is how a project like Cycle looks like. We have our designer, we have our developer, we have our research analysis and implementation phases. During the research, the designer get it, gathers his data and developers does nothing. During the analysis phase, we tend to analyze what we found out from the previous phase and so on and so forth. It's pretty straightforward, at least from a designer point of view. But then we have implementation and we have built our screens and we have said nothing to our developers. And at the end, we have two people fighting each other, which should not happen. And it's not a healthy work, work environment at all. What if we change a few things? We still have our designer and developer from the beginning, but during our research phase, once we finish our planning and we've gathered our data, we, why don't we just invite our developer to observe a few sessions? And when it comes down to the anal analysis phase and we're in this part with the ideation, uh, ideation sessions with our clients, we don't need to explain everything to the developers if they just are, if they're just part of those meetings just taking notes and minding their own business and so on and so forth it would be very very useful for them for sure just to get familiar with the process and the product and what they're about to build and at the end during the implementation phase where we have our wireframes turned out into visual design and we usually implement some testing in between, we ask our developers to review it. I found the third phase extremely useful, especially when I'm not completely aware of the technological restrictions. And I tend to, just to make myself sure, better safe than sorry, I tend to just review my designs with the development team so that they're aware that, they're that they're, there are no features that they can't implement and the client haven't approved yet. So this is very helpful. And at the end, we no longer have uh, people arguing with each other or people blaming each other. And uh, literally, if we just involve them a bit more from the beginning in our process, it solves a lot of pain during the whole process. Continuing with project manager and business analysts. Well, you know what? I can't really give you much feedback on this one because I had the best luck to work with great people who I learned a lot from. And I found my secret. I just need to keep them close because they know everything. And if they don't know that thing that I want to know, they usually know someone who does along the line. They're your guidance. They're your mistake checker. If you have spelled something incorrectly, if you're sc there is a screen missing, if the colors are incorrect, whatever it is, they're there and they're your main support. So use them as they are. And last but not least, how should we collaborate with our managers, creative directors, and so on? Well, first, don't trust the stigma. Our managers are, uh, tend to be overlooked at or perceived as someone who is hard to approach. To this day, I have a great example for my formal lead who I'm, uh, to this day I'm trying to follow. He was extremely friendly and he tried to reach out as much as possible and I did the same. Whenever I had a problem, I reached out to him. Whenever something happened, I reached out to him. Your manager should be your main point of contact but also your buddy with whom you'll be able to share your work problems. And if it doesn't work, remember, that feedback works both ways. Yes, designers should accept constructive criticism, but managers should always be open to feedback, not only when they want to hear it. And as a way to patch it up a bit more practically oriented, I would like to tell you a story or more of a case study where a project fell down the rabbit hole uh, because of miscommunication, uh, and it fell hard. Um, 
to this day we still have no active users on this product. But let's begin with the story. It was a native mobile app in the insurance industry and it's based in the United States. That's very important to note because um, in each state in America there is different laws for everything. So I'll start with pointing out all the wrong things that we did. Well, first, remember at the beginning when I told you that we should get familiar with each other's processes, even outside of our daily stand-ups, and to explain our colleagues the essence of our work? Well, in this project, the technical lead was not completely familiar with what the UX designer does. Uh, during the discovery phase, it was the three of us, uh, me, a business analyst, and a technical lead. He seemed very confused about the fact that I was gathering requirements. He thought that this is a business analyst job and he felt a bit protective as if I'm trying just to look cool and steal this person's job and why am I doing it the way I'm doing it. Until we cleared that out, that was a huge problem for the first months of the project. It was ridiculous. But uh, the second wrong along the line was that the communication with the client was not thorough. I am expressing and explaining to you this project as if it was the worst one, but actually it was my favorite project so far in my, in my whole career, mainly because our client was so cool, he was so enthusiastic, so in love with his idea and his product, that the whole team turned out to be um, very enthusiastic towards our client and at the end we were very happy just to communicate with him and tell him what he wants and it was a great experience uh, until our product was very um, very bad at the end because we didn't clear out requirements as we should have had. And we had legal consequences. Not as legal as someone suing us, but in the States, to be able to purchase insurance or sell insurance as a service, you have to do something in each state. You have to uh, pay specific fees, and that fee depends on the state. And the fact that we didn't check that from the start played a huge role big towards the end goal of the product. But let's focus on the right things. I'll briefly mention them too. We had to roll design documentation. Uh, everything along UI, UX wise was great. We had, uh, we communicated blockers regularly and it was great. Every day there was something new, some new restriction that we were trying to solve because of uh, states and different states and their laws or our client being unaware of most of the things that he should have been aware. But we tried to go around it and finish, uh, finish our product despite all of the blockers and despite everything else. And we were very, very flexible in doing that. Uh, we managed to, uh, I don't know, jump from one problem to the next one and we still found the solutions along the way and we implemented it. Of course, all of this helped, no, I wouldn't say help, all of this really, really restricted the usability of our product and it was, a, a, I would say, a terrible product at the end because uh, for a user to register, he will have to go through a regular process then this process turned out to be really, really long and we then continued to add more and more questions to the registration process. And remember, this is a mobile app, so no one really wants to spend time typing on their phone the whole day. Well, the result is yet no active users, but we have happy clients and have plenty of those. I can tell you a lot of stories about clients that are happy, that our products are great, we have lots of users and so on, but those are not stories that one can learn from a lot. Because of this project and because of the fact that it failed so much, from this point, the t my team and I were now familiar with how 
Should we collaborate better with clients? And we should not trust them that much, even if they seem very enthusiastic and they seem as if they know everything and they're familiar with their field. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, we had this awful flow of registration of almost 15 steps of trying to fill in your information. And yeah, you guessed it. Well, people don't have the patience to register on their mobile phone for, I don't know, half an hour. And you, it's just constant typing. And all of this just to buy insurance that you probably you're not sure that you need yet because there is no information about this specific insurance. And this is just a sneak preview of some of the screens that are part of the registration process. We have, of course, um, agree and continue, and then we have our several choices, and then we have a few more fields to fill in, and then we have a few fields more, and even more. So it was a very fun product, and we were trying to convince our client that this is not a great usability, and it's, it's going to fail, but he was sure that people are used to filling out a lot of things when it comes down to insurance. What if could have been? Um, did, anyone men uh, did anyone notice that I did not mention testing once? We did not test our idea at all, and we were very much aware of that. When it comes to clients, they tend to want everything um, everything from for yesterday and if it's possible for no money at all. Our client was tight on budget and within an MVP he wanted to fill in so much, so, so many functionalities, so many parts of his product. As you saw, so many questions that he'll get his information from uh, during the registration that at the end the product failed and mostly because from the start, we didn't check facts. We didn't collaborate better in understanding the field specifications. And we did not try enough to convince our client that testing is sort of a return of investment. So if we try to build an MVP with smaller amount of functionalities and test it, we can now see if his product would actually be on the market and be successful and so on. What we also didn't suggest is to phase out those functionalities. For example, if a client, if a client comes to us, uh, we try to phase the amount of functionalities that should fit, with, should fit within an MVP shouldn't be a lot. So if we want to test and build a successful product, we should phase them out. For example, um, in phase one, you have, you're building just one feature so that you are sure that you can have your investments back. Phase two, you're building two additional more that you again test with and so on. It's very, very waterfall-like process, but it gives a lot of value in the end. All of this happened because somewhere along the line, something was not communicated. And the fact that this happened meant that someone along the line was not active or not active at all, uh, uh, enough. You can be a good designer if you're not active collaborator because design is basically communication and we should not overlook it because communication and collaboration, it sounds easy, right? But to be good at it, it's actually a skill. Thank you. <laughs>